This photograph was taken just seconds before what would become the single deadliest aviation disaster in the United States on May 25, 1979. American Airlines Flight 191, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, upon leaving Chicago's O'Hare Airport, suffered a catastrophic loss of control on takeoff. After what was just seconds in the air, the DC-10 crashes just beyond the airport boundaries killing 271 people on board, as well as a further two on the ground. The cause of the crash would be found in poor maintenance on what was at the time one of the most popular planes ever built. American Airlines was the launch operator of the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 and was introduced in 1971. The plane, along with the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar, became the world's two options for wide-body trijet aircraft. The distinctive three-engine design with the number two engine located at the rear became synonymous with the ever-expanding world of aviation, especially in the United States. Air travel, in general, was becoming more common and affordable, and the DC-10 was an ideal choice for multiple US carriers for domestic operations between the large American metropolises. Chicago's O'Hare Airport is one of the main hubs for American Airlines. By 1979, American Airlines had taken 35 deliveries of this plane. Even though this was a brand new plane, by the late 1970s, the DC-10 had already been involved in multiple fatal accidents. In 1974, a Turkish Airlines DC-10 crashed just outside of Paris after a cargo door had blown out, severing the plane's flight controls. 346 people were killed in the disaster, which became, at the time, the deadliest aviation disaster ever. One year prior to Flight 191, a Continental Airlines DC-10 crashed at Los Angeles, killing four people. And in the years after Flight 191, the DC-10 would go on to play a part in multiple other major aviation disasters, one of which will be subject to its own video in the coming weeks. American Airlines operated the DC-10 on a route between Chicago and Los Angeles. On May 25, 1979, the DC-10 registered as November 110 Alpha Alpha was to make this flight. Before we can discuss the day of the accident as it happened, we first must discuss what happened eight weeks prior. This DC-10 went in for some routine maintenance and was flown down to Tulsa, Oklahoma at the American Airlines maintenance facility there. During this maintenance, the left number one engine was removed from the wing to be replaced with a new engine. The engines were designed so that they could be dismounted to either replace or to work on maintenance independently from the plane. The two wing-mounted engines are connected to the wing via the pylon. There are three attachment points which hold the pylon onto the wing, one at the back end of the pylon and two at the front, with bulkheads at each end. These attachment points hold the 5-6 to six ton engine and pylon structure through spherical bearings, where on the rear bulkhead is also fitted into a clevis. During the accident plane's last service, eight weeks before the incident, American Airlines had inspected the pylon and decided to replace the bolts which secures the bearings. To do so, they must remove the engine from the wing. In 1978, McDonnell Douglas had issued a bulletin regarding the pylon and called for the spherical bearings to be replaced. This was to correct service-related unsatisfactory conditions. This, however, was to be done at the operator's own convenience, and that the replacement of the pylon's aft bulkhead bearing was optional based on operator's experience. McDonnell Douglas advised with regards to removing the pylon from the wing that in order to do this, the engine should be removed first, and then the pylon separately. However, at American Airlines, mechanics and technicians developed a plan to bypass the need to remove the engine first and remove the engine and pylon as a single lot. This was allegedly done to lower the total number of disconnections that would be needed. Several fuel, hydraulic, and electrical wiring systems run through here. The bolts that attach the pylon and thus the engine to the wing were removed so that the engine structure could be lowered from the wing. To then remove the engine and pylon from the wing, the mechanics at Tulsa had employed a questionable tactic to dismount the engine by using a forklift truck. The use of a forklift was determined to be a quicker and cheaper way of performing this kind of servicing on this aircraft. This procedure would save around 200 work hours. American Airlines were not alone in developing these quicker procedures. United and Continental Airlines were found to have done something similar on their DC-10s. United Airlines reportedly utilized a hoisting device to detach the engine and pylon, whereas Continental and American Airlines 
the use of a forklift was the preferred method. For reconnecting the engine and pylon assembly back onto the wing, it was to be lifted up to the wing on the forklift. Reassembly is delicate, especially with the use of a forklift. As the engine was being repositioned, the pylon was actually damaged during this process. Investigators had suggested that the forklift was unstable and would sometimes tip. Adjustments were made in a trial and error fashion. The clevis, which the rear attachment point fits into, had come into contact with the pylon with enough force that it caused the pylon structure to crack and bend. This was evidenced by the recovered pylon from the crash site, which showed indentation similar in shape to that of the clevis which was supposed to hold it in place. The investigation determined that in order for this to be possible, the bolt located here would have to have been removed, therefore the damage to the pylon was caused before the accident, and during the maintenance the plane underwent 8 weeks prior to the accident, which meant that this DC-10 left the hangar and flew with a damaged engine pylon, and every time it flew in that time period, the damage only grew. With this information, we can now take a closer look at the day of the accident. On May 25th, 1979, an American Airlines DC-10 flying as Flight 191 is preparing for a flight to Los Angeles out of Chicago's O'Hare Airport. There were 258 passengers and 13 crew members on board the flight that day. The DC-10 requires a flight crew of three to fly. On this trip, Captain Walter Lux, age 53, was actually expected to be heading home instead of taking this flight. He changed his schedule last minute. His first officer was James Dillard, age 49, and behind those two, was 56-year-old flight engineer Alfred Udovich. Captain Lux had been flying the DC-10 since its launch in 1971. However, both the first officer and flight engineer were rather new to the plane. Together, between them, they had less than 2,000 total hours in the DC-10. American Airlines Flight 191 left the gate at 2.59pm and taxied out to runway 32 right. American Airlines ground staff at Chicago did not notice anything wrong with the aircraft as it left the stand. The first officer, James Dillard, will be the one handling the flight controls on takeoff. Weather conditions that day were clear. There was a 22 knot wind coming from north northeast, and visibility was over 10 miles. On this departure, the rotation or takeoff speed was 145 knots. On departure, there are three airspeed indications of note. V1 is what is commonly known as the point of no return on takeoff. Once passing the speed, an aircraft is committed to the takeoff. This is because it would no longer be safe to abort the departure in relation to the speed of the plane and what is left of usable runway. VR is the rotation speed, the point where the pilots can safely pull back on the flight controls and angle the plane into the air. V2 is a failsafe speed, this is the minimum speed needed in case of an engine failure. In the case of Flight 191, the V2 was 153 knots. In position on runway 32 right at Chicago, American Airlines Flight 191 is cleared for takeoff at 3.02 p.m. Flight 191 then begins its takeoff roll as normal. Everything appeared to be routine. Inside the left engine pylon, which is connected to the left wing, the pylon was weakened to the point where it cannot hold onto the wing any longer. It is what happened at just before the rotation speed, VR, which is of significance. Eyewitnesses on the ground were unanimously unified in their accounts of what happened to the left number one engine. The left pylon which connects the left number one engine to the wing broke at the rear. This caused the engine to lift at the front where it broke off completely before flipping over the top of the wing and landing on the runway. This occurred just before rotation according to the official report. By the time that the crew noticed that something was wrong, it was already too late to abort the takeoff, having then accelerated past V1. Fuel and hydraulic fluid was then seen streaming from the damaged wing by those on the ground. When the engine and pylon structure was ripped away from the wing, it had also torn a 1 meter section of the wing's leading edge, which houses electrical and hydraulic systems for the wing, namely the leading edge slats. The engine and wing leading edge debris was later found on and near runway 32 right after the incident. The breaching of the section of the wing will cause the slats on the left wing to automatically retract once the hydraulic fluid runs dry. The breach has also severed the flight instruments and systems powered by the left engine. Among the systems that were lost was the plane's stall warnings and alert systems to warn the pilots that the slats on the left wing would be retracted. As Flight 191 leaves the ground and begins to climb, it becomes clear to the crew and the control tower that the plane must immediately return to the airport. 
The onboard engine instruments show that power has been lost to the number one engine, and pilot flying First Officer James Dillard follows the procedure he was taught for loss of an engine on takeoff. The plane was then slowed to the V2 speed, what should have been the minimum safe climbing speed with the loss of an engine. The DC-10 can fly on the two remaining engines. However, as the last of the hydraulic fluid in the left wing leading edge bleeds away, the slats are attracted without the crew knowing. Slats are used to generate lift at a slower speed, ideal for takeoff. Although now that the plane has slowed, the decrease in lift following the retraction of the left leading edge slats causes an imbalance of lift on the wings. More lift is now being generated from the right wing over the left. The slower speed compounded by the decrease in lift efficiency places the aircraft dangerously close to stalling. At around 300 feet of altitude, Flight 191 enters an asymmetric stall. The plane begins to roll over to the left, overbanking until the plane's nose drops below the horizon. It was during this time and these few seconds that this photograph was taken from the ground. It shows Flight 191, the DC-10, flying without its left engine, and hydraulic fluid and fuel streaming from the left wing. At 3.04 in the afternoon, American Airlines Flight 191 crashes just outside of the airport boundaries at Chicago just beyond runway 32 right. The plane crashes into a field where it disintegrates and explodes on impact. The plane not only crashed into the field, but also into the nearby trailer park where a further two people were killed on the ground. All 271 of the people on board the DC-10 were killed in the disaster. The following investigation was subjected to the public spotlight. The National Transportation Safety Board ruled that the cause of the crash was due to the asymmetric stall caused by the damage to the left wing, which itself was induced from poor maintenance practices at American Airlines. The NTSB cited that American Airlines had not thoroughly evaluated their maintenance practices and had they examined the results of their efforts and to quote, the procedure might have disclosed difficulties that would have concerned the engineering staff. Flight simulation tests were also carried out with 13 DC-10 pilots. Out of all the cases where the recovered flight control inputs from Flight 191 were duplicated, the aircraft could not be recovered and the plane was lost in the simulator. The crash of American Airlines Flight 191 was the single deadliest aviation accident to occur in American history. There has never been a death toll as high as this in the United States, and there has not been since. Hello, good evening everyone, welcome to the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching all the way through to the end. If you enjoy this type of content, be sure to subscribe as there are new videos every Saturday. There's a few things I want to mention here. Firstly, in case you missed it, I uploaded two videos this week, this being the second of the two, the first of which was uploaded on Tuesday. The second thing is that I have created an official playlist of videos from the most recent first, so if you fancy having a disaster breakdown marathon, that is now available for your viewing. The last thing I quickly want to mention is that I have now settled on a time for when new videos go out, which will be for the foreseeable future, 6pm British summer time as here in the UK we have just recently switched to daylight savings. Eastern time in the United States is usually around about 5 hours behind, however it varies from state to state if I am not mistaken. Anyway, it's that time where I must thank my patrons for their continued support. If you would like to have your name featured or read out at the end of next week's video, as well as getting new videos early on early access 48 hours before going public on YouTube, you can join my Patreon from £3 per month. Thank you to my £5 patrons, Aidan Montgomery, Hector Palmer Tellers, Jacopo, KTP123, Ken Zachman, Christy, Marie Innes, Pacman7, and Wrongtrack58. And I must also thank my £10 patrons for their generous support Cherub Cherub, Daniel Hendricks, D. Rogers, Side Effect, and Will Tanner. A big thanks to you guys. Thank you so much. And that's it for me this week. I hope you enjoyed the two videos this time. Have a great weekend and I will see you next week. Goodbye.